Castlevania, known in Japan as Akumajo Dracula, was a series that lasted for more than 20 years, totaling at least 30 some odd titles including remakes and other oddities. If you're of the opinion that games are not made by corporations, it still survives today with Koji Igarashi's Bloodstained series, but the original IP has mostly ceased to exist unless you count the gambling machines. Unlike many Japanese game series, Akuma do Dracula generally received contemporary overseas releases from its developer-publisher Konami from the very beginning. In contrast to Final Fantasy, Castlevania fans didn't have to wait years to play the second and third games. There's one game that I have never stopped hearing about from fans since the day it came out, or didn't come out, as the case may be. It's not usually situated at the tip-top of the Pantheon, but somehow it always makes its way into discussions, lists, and retrospectives like this one from names you may recognize. The first Akuma Jo Dracula game not to make it to distant shores was the eponymous game released for the Sharp X68000 home computer, which despite the fact that you or your family probably own a Sharp electronic device of some sort, was sold only in Japan and did not receive a revamped western equivalent. That game was a 1993 remake of the original Akuma Jo Dracula for the Famicom, so many players likely felt that they weren't missing out on anything particularly notable. Though it has its crowd, it's actually pretty good. We did eventually get the game as a PlayStation port eight years later in 2001, so all's well that ends well, I guess. Well, it's not exactly the same, but it does the job. However, let's fast forward to November 16th, 2006, when the Nintendo DS game Castlevania Portrait of Ruin was released in Japan. By the time the rest of the world received this game, they had received a version of every other mainline Akuma Jo Dracula game that had been released up to that point. Well, except for one, 1993's Akuma Jo Dracula X, Chi no Rondo, Castlevania Dracula X Rondo of Blood, for the PC Engine CD. Or wait, did we? There was another game released almost two years later for the Super Nintendo called Castlevania Dracula X, Vampire's Kiss in Europe, which presents roughly the same framework as the PC Engine game. This game is sometimes referred to as, or implied to be, the Western equivalent of Rondo of Blood, but that's not entirely accurate. It's not like Snake's Revenge, where it was developed for North American and European markets in lieu of a different game. Japan also received Dracula X, though its title there is Dracula Double X. We wouldn't get Dracula XXX until Konami started producing Akuma Jo Dracula Pachinko machines, but that's a different story. Dracula X is almost universally agreed to be an inferior representation of Rondo of Blood, though it has its fans. So why did most of us never get to play Rondo when it was new? If there's one thing I know about the 90s, it's just that video game localization was fickle, and there's not always a great reason behind these stories. Actually, Konami seems responsible for a lot of them. You can't use the Sharp X68000 excuse here. The PC Engine and CD add-on component were available in several major markets, though it was known as the TurboGrafx-16 in North America. A lot of the game was already in English, or German, and it's not that wordy anyway, so they wouldn't need to spend a ton of time or effort translating and dubbing the game. Can we invoke the Western gamers don't like anime aesthetics reasoning? Sales data, as always, seems dubious, called from online sources. One might expect that steadily decreasing sales could be the culprit for this sort of thing, but without official or properly cited contemporary sales figures, it seems silly to argue. And in any case, they went right on and released Bloodlines a year later. Three years after that came a monster. Symphony of the Night was a direct sequel to Rondo of Blood. Their Japanese titles make this more obvious. Rondo of Blood is Akuma Jo Dracula X, Chi no Rondo, while Symphony of the Night is Akuma Jo Dracula X, Gekka no Yaso Kyoku, which actually doesn't mean Symphony of the Night, it's Moonlit Nocturne or Nocturne in the Moonlight. In fact, most Castlevania titles are arbitrarily different, whether you're looking at one from the classic or Metroidvania eras. Rondo of Blood is one of the few exceptions, probably because by the time it was finally localized, it already had an established name in the fandom. Although, there is something funny going on with the Japanese title that gets kind of ironed out in translation. You see how these two kanji are interrupted by a few simpler characters? This type of superimposed furigana is called Gikun. These kanji were given an artificial reading, Rondo. Normally, the two of them together make Rinne, which means Samsara, or the concept that all existence is cyclical. 
In fact, the official Rondo of Blood strategy guide actually refers to the game as Reincarnation of Blood. It doesn't mean either interpretation is wrong, just that it has a little extra going on. A Rondo, of course, is a musical piece that has a recurring central theme, so the parallel is obvious. For a long time, I assumed that Koji Igarashi was sole director-producer of Symphony of the Night, since it is the first of what came to be termed Igavenias, but in truth, it was half and half between him and Toru Hagihara. Interestingly, they did not exactly work in tandem. As Igarashi explained in an interview with Rolling Stone, Mr. Hagihara was the original director, but when he was promoted and became the head of our division, he asked me to take over the project from there. So it's not like there was any conflict. He simply was promoted to a position that didn't allow him to continue as the director, so I filled in. The credits to Rondo of Blood give special thanks to Igarashi, who, according to a Eurogamer interview, would play the in-development Rondo at Konami offices. All of this is to say that Igarashi actually had very little to do with Rondo of Blood, but it's important in terms of his personal history and that of Castlevania as a whole. Symphony of the Night, on the other hand, was a massive hit in every major region, and that ensured it would receive a number of ports and re-releases over the years. Castlevania, The Dracula X Chronicles for the PlayStation Portable, released first in North America on October 23, 2007, almost 14 years to the day from the Japanese release of Rondo Blood. A full remake of Rondo, Chronicles is no mere reskin, adding to and rearranging much of Rondo's story and gameplay. This is one of the few games I still own a physical copy of for myriad reasons. I cannot actually recall interacting with a single person who played this game for the remake itself and not for the unlockables, which include the full original games of Rondo of Blood and Symphony of the Night. That's not to say the remake isn't decent, but they certainly are two different things and we'd be getting ahead of ourselves to talk about the remake first. To unlock Rondo of Blood, you have to take an alternate path in one of the stages and whip an out-of-the-way candle. Weird, but cool. This was how I first played the original game, but considering there are some minor imperfections to this port, I'm mostly going to show you the PC Engine version. As I intimated before, Rondo of Blood is not terribly difficult to pick up and play for the Japanese non-fluent. You won't understand the story, but I'm sure you can guess, right? Dracula's back along with his ride or die pal the Grim Reaper, and it's your job to chain whip them in the dick. Well, actually, this is the first one to throw the Drac kidnapped your girlfriend wrinkle into the whole ordeal. It's not the only Castlevania to adopt overt anime stylings, but it was the first and only one for a while. It's voice acted, and cutscenes cannot be skipped. This might turn some people off, but these cutscenes are not awfully long nor poorly paced, and many of them have to be sought out. The game can largely be played without triggering most of them. However, part of the point of the game is to rescue the four girls being held captive throughout Akuma Joe Dracula, the last of them being your girlfriend Annette, and all of them have cutscenes associated with them. From a gameplay standpoint, however, the most important girl to find is Maria, who can become a playable character. ヴァンパイアハンターだ。君は<笑> <笑>マリアンジもヴァンパイアハンターなんだよ。だから今から友達ね。友達ね。だがな、マリアにはまだ無理だ。悪いおじちゃんをやっつけるのはお兄ちゃんに任しときな。そんなことないもん。マリア平
Maria is the game's easy mode, though there are a few aspects by which Richter has some sort of advantage. Richter has a double jump backflip with a tight window to activate it, while Maria can double jump in any direction with no special timing. Richter whips in a straight line, whereas Maria fires up to two doves at a time that do better damage per second and cover a broader area. Richter can make use of all sorts of classic Castlevania sub-weapons, but Maria has her own personal arsenal of fantastical animal-based weaponry that even includes invincibility. The downsides to Maria are that she dies more quickly, and her sub-weapons aren't necessarily tailored to situations in the way that Richter's are. Something I've learned about Castlevania over the years is that the games will often try to highlight and provide you with the best weapon for the job at various steps along the way. For example, if you go down this tantalizing optional path in Stage 6, you can get the Grimoire, which for Richter is by far the best weapon to tackle the forthcoming boss rush. As Maria, the Songbook is not notably helpful in the same situation. If you're wondering, should I play through the game as Richter or Maria, I would say the answer is probably both. They are different enough experiences that you can probably derive enjoyment out of doing full playthroughs as each character individually, though if you lose all your lives or back out to the menu, you can switch mid-playthrough. If you must play through the game only once with one of the characters, I'd say go for Richter. After all, Rihita de pre surinoga tokote mondaze. By the time Ronda was being made, the first Castlevania had already been remade or adapted several times. You had the MSX2 version, the X68000 game we talked about, and its PlayStation port, and Super Castlevania 4, plus the arcade game if you count that. Rondo of Blood was the first game that was sort of a remake, but not really. Obviously the point of these games having to do with the periodic resurrection of Dracula in the same general space in the world means that yes, of course much of the castle and landscape would remain the same, but some of the games refract more of the first game's light than others. Not only does Rondo do this, it has bits from the other games too, like the town from the second game and more of the outdoor themes from the third. This game and Bloodlines were kind of the last hurrah as far as Castlevania taking place anywhere other than Castle Dracula, which makes Rondo especially feel like a swan song. Of course, the main reason it feels that way is because most Castlevania games released after that point, starting of course with Rondo's sequel, incorporated freeform exploration and progression systems. I've always said that in its worst moments, Symphony of the Night is too forgiving. It's a magnificent game, but the balance is so far out of whack that every time I play it I always feel that once I've hit a certain power threshold, there's basically no tension anymore. Coupled with the fact that saving and restoring health are commonly available, most playthroughs feel deterministic. In point of fact, Rondo of Blood, like Super Castlevania 4, made its own changes to the blueprint that rendered it more welcoming than many of its predecessors. There's no time limit. Sub-weapons will not irreversibly replace one another when collected. Richter and Maria have an expensive panic button called the item crash. And most importantly, there's less of a focus on pitfalls. And in the places where they do exist with enemies that want to knock you down into them, it often just leads to alternate content. These aspects don't radically change the difficulty on their own. The item crash feels a bit cheap sometimes when used against bosses, but there's incentive not to use up all your hearts in the sense that several uses of your sub-weapon might be better to have in the long run, and if you're going for points, unused hearts add to your score. Hell, the game even tries to dissuade you from forcing a continue scenario by shaming you a little bit in the menus. Something that's interesting is that, while the boss's last gasp attacks can't kill you, in the now rare demo version of the game, they can, indicating that the developers made conscious decisions to tone down the difficulty. In fact, programmer Shingo Takatsuka said, I'm something of a freak, so I think it's better if games are difficult in general. That made for a real problem trying to adjust the difficulty. I'd say the game was five times harder at the outset than what made it to store shelves. Time limit never felt like a factor even in the toughest parts of old Castlevania, so removing it entirely just feels like cleaning up. And although you are often given a mulligan when falling down a pit, these paths are sometimes arguably more difficult, so it evens out. When I fail in Rondo of Blood, I never feel like things were out of my control. I feel like the game beat me fair and square, and it makes me want to try again and do better. There are some random factors here and there. For example, sometimes in Stage 2, when you're being chased through this hallway and need to avoid getting hit by these zombies, sometimes they spawn at especially awkward times. Something I had to learn the hard way over the years with Castlevania is that jumping all the time is not as good of an idea as it is in other platformers. But here you don't really have a choice. 
Again, you get alternate content when you fall down here, so it doesn't feel as bad as it could, but if you're trying to get the key from this hallway, you're out of luck as far as I can tell. Another thing is the bosses. Castlevania bosses have never followed predictable patterns, but the distribution of their discrete attacks seems even less balanced than usual. This results sometimes in absurdly easy bosses where they overuse a slow or easy to avoid attack, but can also swing the other way and have them pin you in a corner or something. Maybe it's just my imagination, but I have heard people say things like they've seen bosses use attacks they've never seen before in countless attempts. If you watch a speed run of Rondo of Blood, you'll probably notice quite a few instances of the runner praying for good RNG, not just with bosses either. Amusingly, the meta is to backflip everywhere, as you can get over enemies more easily, and it's marginally faster anyway. Oh yeah, I barely talked about the moves and character control. Unlike Castlevania IV, Richter can only whip straight forward like in all the other previous titles. Well, in X68000 you can whip down, I think, but it's not as easy as in Super. Despite this, Richter feels good. Enemies rarely take advantage of your unidirectional whip. Everything feels a bit more crisp and responsive without devolving into abuse. A common complaint about 4 is that you can finagle too many situations where being able to whip in a certain direction trivializes certain encounters. And there is truth to that. Part of the argument is, that's what the sub-weapons are for, and I think Rondo does an amazing job at making all of them feel useful and making them available at the right times if you're keeping an eye out. You might have to fail once or twice in order to know for the future, but there's not too much trial and error. Maybe if a boss gives you too much trouble, you can just bypass it entirely. When I said Rondo gives you alternate content, I didn't just mean one or two screens at a time. You can end up fighting an entirely different boss and move on to a whole other stage. On top of that, you can go back to the menu and select previous stages from your file, eventually mapping out the entire game for 100% completion. You have to visit at least some of these alternate stages if you want to rescue all the girls. The player is free to tailor their playthrough how they like, or play it from a certain point onward, especially in order to skip the prologue. All of this is why I like to call Rondo of Blood the transitional Castlevania. It has a linear format, but there are enough features that the player can jump around and do a highlights run if they so desire, which makes it a halfway point on the way to the freeform exploration of the Iga Vanias. If you feel like the old style is too dry and pays too close homage to classic horror, but also think the flamboyant tendencies of later entries are too much, Rondo strikes a good balance with just a bit of cheesiness that you can avoid if you so desire. Ultimately, what really holds the game together is the soundtrack. The first piece the player hears is Requiem, which was reused for Circle of the Moon. Symphony of the Night would use a similar theme for its file select screen called Prayer. In the cutscene before stage zero, Richter's theme Divine Bloodline plays, and a variation plays during stage one as well. This theme has appeared in a number of Castlevania games since Rondo, sometimes in direct tie-ins. The same being true of the Dracula battle theme, Illusionary Dance. The iconic Vampire Killer, which first appeared in the opening stage of the first game, is used for stage two here. Stage three uses the second game's Bloody Tears, while stage four features Beginning from Castlevania three. The stage 7 theme, Den, interpolates all three. Most of what's left is entirely original, allowing Rondo to perfectly accentuate Richter's and Maria's personalities and those of the original stages while showing deference to the rest of the series up until that point. 
This is important because the Akuma Joe Dracula legacy had been passed around to several different producers, directors, designers, and composers through its first several games. It was a series built on the backs of more creatives than you could count, rather than a single auteur. Yet, Rondo still manages to carve out its own place in the series, skillfully bookending the game with original music that, fittingly, would go on to be referenced and homaged in games to come. A Rondo of love. Metal Yuki, who wrote a good share of the new music, said, I wanted to manifest accordingly what was resounding in the minds of those who had played the Famicom games. This concept informed my arrangements. I endeavored to make them more like transcriptions than rearrangements. There are three ways you can play Rondo of Blood at the time of this recording. The good news about the PC Engine CD version is that the CD components of the various consoles, including the TurboGrafx CD and the Turbo Duo, are not region locked. The PSP version is easy to unlock within the game's remake, and the PlayStation 4 version included in Castlevania Requiem is based on this version. I personally had the best time with the PC Engine CD version, but the differences between it and the ports aren't game-breaking. As for Dracula X Chronicles, it's by no means something you should play instead of Rondo of Blood, but it's a decent game on its own. It's worth playing both, as Chronicles mixes up some of the content and adds collectibles. The added story sequences and things like pre-boss cutscenes kind of kill the pace, especially when it interrupts the boss rush near the end of the game, but they can be skipped, unlike in Rondo. So what is it that makes Rondo of Blood so beloved among Castlevania fans? I feel that a big part of it was the anticipation. There were a number of great games that were teased to overseas audiences back in the 1990s which inexplicably never made it anywhere outside of Japan or only in select markets. When magazines featured games like this one, it created a false sense of, if Japan is withholding a particular game, it must be amazing. The truth, of course, is that there was an ocean of other Japanese games the rest of us never saw, and still don't know exist, and many of those were awful. This is called selection bias. That is to say, Rondo of Blood is good, but that had no correlation with the availability of Japanese games at that time. However, there's something more to Rondo that has eluded me all this time. The best way I can put it is that most video games tend to speak to one type of fan, but Rondo is silver-tongued and can charm just about anyone. You like Classicvania? I've got pretty much the same format. You prefer Egovania? I was the precursor. You like Symphony of the Night's Flare, but wish it were dialed back just a bit? I'm just the right amount of crazy. You think the classic games are too difficult or unforgiving, but you like the idea of it all? I'm a good middle ground to get you into it all. You like freedom, but dislike the paralyzing nature of open exploration games? I've got the right size cage for you. And you like cool CD quality music? Of course you do. I've got that too. Rondo of Blood is the product of designers who each knew not to take things too far in any one direction and create a balanced experience with something everyone can appreciate. And once that single aspect has pulled you in, maybe you'll come to enjoy some of the features you thought were intended for somebody else.